Hi, I'm Diana Euler, Division Manager for Public Works Finance. Welcome to Inside Public Works. Who maintains over 660 miles of roads, 150 miles of streams, channels, and other drainage, and over 150 county buildings throughout Contra Costa County? We do. Who maintains parks and recreation facilities, sandbag distribution stations, and flood control throughout the unincorporated areas of Contra Costa County while operating two airports located in Central and East County? We do. Thank you for joining us on Inside Public Works. I'm your host, Kelly Kalsbeck. Looking at the Serene Creek, you wouldn't think there would be any danger around here. However, conditions can change rapidly. That's why our first segment takes us to visit with Tim Jensen, Assistant Public Works Director and Division Manager of our Flood Control and Water Conservation District. Tim tells us why it's important to stay out, stay alive, and why each October is designated Creek and Channel Safety Awareness Month. I'm out here at one of our flood control channels and today we are talking about creek and channel safety awareness. Every October we are reinforcing, reminding people of our message that our channels are dangerous and it's important that you stay out and stay alive. This big concrete channel behind us is our largest flood control channel in the county and this is an area where there's a transition from the concrete channel over here to the more natural earthen channel. In this transition area it's really important that as the water is flowing out of there at high speed and has a lot of energy that the energy is dissipated in this structure. We call this an energy dissipating structure and it's specifically designed to slow down the water. It builds a lot of just turbidity and motion into the water. It kind of forces it back on itself and it reduces the energy, if we didn't have this, then the area down here could be uh, washed away in a big storm. People were playing in the creek, floating their boats and rafts before when it was a natural creek and it was slow and it was calm and safe. And then when this was put in, they thought it would be the same, but it's a whole lot faster and a whole lot more dangerous. On a nice day like today, you might ask yourself, what's so dangerous about going into these facilities? Well, there's a couple of things. One is the floor is pretty slippery with the algae and the water. The walls are vertical, so there's really no way to get out. And there can also be debris, broken glass, those kind of things that are not good. So there's been situations in the past where people have gone into this flood control channel during the winter to try to raft it or go in a kayak and they did not make it out alive. Unfortunately, in 2011, uh, two high school students that were former WCI students during uh, a big storm decided that they would put a raft in the, the creek channel um, to the south area of here and try to raft down the, the creek channel when the water was rushing at high levels. Um, unfortunately, they lost their lives while doing this and had a big impact on the community and was a uh, tragic reminder to everyone um, in the Walnut Creek and, and beyond communities that while the water levels when they do get high and the water is rushing it can look like something that would be fun to, to river raft down uh, per se um, but this was just a, uh, a reminder that it can be very deadly. Since that time we've had a pretty good sized outreach program to all the schools in the county. During the month of October, we call it Stay Out, Stay Alive Month or Creek and Channel Safety Awareness Month. And we inform the schools, remind the schools about our program. Many schools do take advantage of the messages that we have to offer that they can send home to parents. We have developed a good relationship with Walnut Creek Intermediate School. We have a thousand students here at WCI and our campus is split um, east and west. The Creek Channel is what divides our campus. We have two bridges that connect both sides and all thousand students cross these bridges multiple times each day at school. It's a unique feature and it's a, a novelty for many kids to 
say that they have a creek that runs underneath their school and that they have two bridges. And we always joke that we have two bridges and we don't charge a toll. So uh, <laughs> they find humor in that, but um, it is a unique aspect of our campus that they enjoy and it, it sets us apart from other schools. During the rainy season, when the water levels are, are higher and the water is rushing underneath the bridges, it is a spectacle. The kids are seeing it every day. So they've been working with us and they have a one day event every year in October where they are educating the kids about the dangers of the channel, telling them to inform their parents and their friends that they need to stay out, stay alive. We also take that opportunity to have the kids do posters. We have a poster contest and then the posters from that contest we have laminated and are putting those up on our facilities to help get the message out. So shortly after the tragic events in 2011, um, the Flood Control District reached out to us here at WCI and I was actually the leadership teacher at the time and wanted to talk to students and members of the community to figure out ways to, to make the community more aware of the dangers that the creek can pose. And um, during the, their campaign post-2011, came out with the slogan, Stay Out, Stay Alive and those actual words are, are sketched on the side of the channel here for students to see as they cross both bridges on each side. And it is a, a subtle reminder that um, while the creek can look fun and inviting, it is actually very dangerous and um, serves a different purpose. I, I love the Stay Out, Stay Alive program because it is an annual reminder during our, our uh, Flood Control Awareness Month in October. Um, for students to understand the dangers that the creek that they, they cross daily multiple times um, can be very dangerous. And doing it in October is perfect timing as we are just about to enter the rain season in the area here. So giving them the, uh, the, the information and knowledge prior to the rain season is valuable. So when the creek does rise and the water levels are high, they uh, understand the dangers that it can pose when the winter rains come, this channel starts filling and taking a lot of water. It takes water from a huge community, so there's a huge amount of water coming through it. It's important to protect the community so that these downstream residents don't experience flooding or bank erosion. But this is a very dangerous place. No one should play around here. No one should go into the concrete channel here. We think that social media is a great way to get the message of stay out, stay alive. To your, to your friends. If you're in school, you have Instagram, you have TikTok. Once you hear this message, spread the message to your friends. Pay attention to the signs and do what they say. Stay out, stay alive. To learn more about our Flood Control and Water Conservation District's programs and their Stay Out, Stay Alive campaign, visit cccpublicworks.org. At Contra Costa County Public Works, we provide quality programs, projects, and services to improve the quality of life for our customers and communities, like our pavement management program. Recently, we got to catch up with our maintenance road crews and take a ride along with their chip seal crew to see them in action. This is a surface treatment program. What it does is it's preserving the road in the condition that it is. We're sealing the road and we're putting a wear coast on it. We do it in the summertime because we need the temperatures to be right. We can't do it at night just because the temperatures wouldn't be right and it's a lot dang more dangerous to work on the roads at nighttime. They, um, the crews come out, they set up signs and have traffic control. That's what everything starts with traffic control. We try not to get out there. We don't get out there until there's proper traffic control so it's a safe job site. This is part of our um, pavement preservation program. We do a lot of prep work on this road. We do crack ceiling, lace failures and some leveling, get the road ready. And then we come in and we put a chip coat on the top, which preserves the road. So we're good for another five to seven years, sometimes even longer. Um, the crew behind us is putting a, a double chip coat down, which is going to seal the road and give us a good wear coat. So if we wait too long to do this road or if we don't do it, the road deteriorates faster. And then we end up having to spend more money on it. We're scheduled about two or three years out on the roads that need to have surfaced work done. So we check them. We grade the roads, make sure that they need to be done, and we try to hit the roads, the right road at the right time with the right treatment. A lot of planning goes into this to see how much we're gonna do that year and where our budget is and that, so like the SB1 money and that helps out on this. All the tax money you're paying for gas is 
this is where it's going. He does all the planning of the roads we're gonna do. He sets the schedule, he checks the measurements, orders the rock, orders the oil, and kind of figures out how everything goes. And then we kind of work together with the road crews to get them all prepped and ready to go. And all, everybody works together just to, so that we can do this project. First off in the morning, we have the road pre-swept. He takes care of any debris that's on there. Then when they turn around and make the second pass, he sweeps along the edge so we get a good fine edge between the two. Our crews come out, they replace the tabs and all the markers so that when we paint it back, we'll know where to put it. They line up the trucks. We get the oil trucks lined up, we start shooting the oil. We put rock down on there. And then we roll it in. And then at, after about an hour or two after we're done, they come in and sweep it so that it's safe for the evening, and then we'll come back tomorrow and do more sweeping. After this is done, we still gotta come back and put all the paint down, the markers down, and any of the legends, the stops, the bars, the crosswalks, we have to put that all back in. And that'll be happen a couple weeks after this, once we get all the loose rock up, we start painting. The paint has um, beads in it and it reflects. The autonomous cars actually use that to help keep themselves in the lanes. So by us painting that, it makes the road safer. Even for just a regular car that you drive yourself, you can see the lines. The white lines, which they call the fog line, that's really important in the fog because that's the only thing you can see most of the time. So by putting the paint back on there, it just makes the road a safer road so you can see at night. It's a very rewarding job, you know, just to see what you can do. You have to have that reward every day. And the crew gets that, you know, they know they did a good job. To learn more about our pavement management program, visit cccpublicworks.org. While our crews work hard to make the road safe, even the safest road can become dangerous if people aren't observing the rules. That's why our Board of Supervisors adopted the Vision Zero Action Plan on April 1st, 2022. We recently caught up with Monish Sin, Senior Traffic Engineer in our Transportation Engineering Division, and his partners with California Highway Patrol and Contra Costa Health Services to find out more about this important policy. In the past, we are looking at how do we get as many people from point A to point B in the most efficient way possible by car. Now what we're looking at with Vision Zero is how do we look at all the road users, especially our most vulnerable road users. Those are bicyclists, pedestrians, children's go children going to school. We've got to look at all of our road users and try to design a, a road network that serves all of them. Every time that we as a county think about ways to prevent things before they happen, our communities will be safer and healthier. And I think Vision Zero is one of those unique opportunities where we can really think upstream about how we can prevent those serious crash and injuries in the first place. Now, working with Public Works, we get a lot of things like the ability to share our data. Uh, we can find common issues with our traffic complaints and the major complaints that they're receiving as well. Uh, we have the common goal of reducing major injury collisions and also fatal collisions and also the common goal of utilizing community outreach and public relations to help with this. One person who dies on the road or is severely injured has basically a snowball effect on the rest of the community. That's why we're trying to get to zero so that we don't have a health crisis on our on our hands. To give that public health perspective about 
um, how injuries really impact a community and impact public health, impact our hospitals, and we want to prevent that as much as possible. It has been such a wonderful opportunity to have public health at the table when plans like Vision Zero are being created because there's a lot to consider when, you're, when, when we're thinking about public health and public works. Um, and Vision Zero is, has such an amazing um, concept of trying to really set the stage, make things right from the start so that the people who are using our um, streets and our sidewalks are healthy, are, are safe. We're looking at a situation where no death on our roadway is acceptable. The Vision Zero plan is a data-driven approach. We looked at all of the collisions that occurred over our, on our roadways. With that, we developed what was called a high injury network. And that identified hotspots throughout the county where there are a, a lot of either fatal co collisions or severe injury collisions. We, we tried to refocus on our energies and limited funds towards those areas. And how do we do that? You develop projects to try to implement countermeasures that would help reduce, if not eliminate, those fatalities in the future. Countermeasures can be curb extensions or ball bouts, which enhance pedestrian safety by shortening crossing distances. Rumble strips provide an audible warning to reduce incidences of head-on collisions. Rapid repeating flashing beacons are used at marked crosswalks to enhance pedestrian safety. Raised crosswalks are undulations at crosswalks which require approaching vehicles to reduce speed. With the road diet, let's reduce lanes. Let's get rid of the lanes. Let's repurpose the lanes for, say, bicyclists or pedestrians. Now, we have a goal with the CHP called lowering the mileage to death rate. And with Vision Zero, this is a action plan that is going to help us do that. And that's something we seek to do every year lower the amount of collisions, the amount of deaths, the amount of major injuries that we see on our roads. Also working with Public Works, we're able to use our social media and our community outreach to be able to speak to our citizens and find where these problem areas are and find where they want us to uh, put our educational efforts. We cannot develop a Vision Zero plan in a void. We need partners and partners who are actively looking at safety throughout the county. Uh, we both are you want to use things like social media, uh, getting into high schools, talking with our new drivers, talking with some of our older drivers, and even talking about pedestrian and bicycle safety. We were able to get some funding to deploy a campaign, an educational campaign, that urges people to slow down and to be careful and to look out for children in particular. And this was deployed in East County, um, around the Bay Point community. We're really hoping to be able to deploy this campaign countywide. Complete Streets is a new is is incorporating other road users, not just emphasizing the needs of the vehicular traffic, but looking at the needs of other folks on the road. So a complete street in that it accommodates bicyclists safely. It accommodates pedestrians safely. It provides refuges for people to perhaps stop in between as they're crossing the road. There's a, there's a walking school bus that has been established for a while. And the children walk about almost a mile from Verde Elementary School to a local community center. And along the route, they had trouble um, feeling safe for a number of reasons, including there were no crosswalks and it wasn't sort of um, highlighted as a safe route for the children to walk. And we brought them an idea that we could paint some beautiful stencils on the sidewalks with the help of the community. And we were able to find a little funding, collaborate with others, including Public Works. It took us about three paint days, but we managed to put stencils all the way from Verde Elementary to the community center. It looks beautiful. The children love it. Um, they feel safer. Another real positive to adopting a Vision Zero plan is looking at sustainability. Because when we walk, bike, roll instead of driving, what we're doing is not only helping our own health and benefit, we're also reducing the amount of carbon in the air and thus producing an overall better environment. To learn more about the Vision Zero program, visit our website, cccpublicworks.com.
LibriVox.org. Our next stop is to North Richmond, where we got to visit with Adelina Huerta, Supervising Civil Engineer in our Design Construction Department and their Division Manager, to find out more about the Fred Jackson Way First Mile, Last Mile Connection Project. We also met with some community members to find out what this project meant to them. Public Works maintains our roadway infrastructure through either maintenance projects or projects that we receive from community requests. In this particular case, the North Richmond Municipal Advisory Committee reached out to our Transportation Engineering Group to identify potential pedestrian improvements and bicycle improvements that they wanted along Fred Jackson Way. Jeff Valeros from our Transportation Engineering Group can provide a little bit more information on what that project was. So here's the beginning of the project on the southern side. This is Grove Avenue. And what we have here as part of the improvements are widened sidewalks as well as what we call bulb outs on the intersections. By widening the sidewalks, communities can actually, families can walk together side by side as they go access the destinations such as the local market, the upcoming grocery store, the community church here, the uh, urban farm, urban tilth. We were so excited when we were able to start the farm, the North Richmond farm, just down Fred Jackson Way at Brookside Drive. And, you know, people were pretty excited to come and visit. And one of the first times that I really realized we had a big problem was when we had a, a couple of classes from Verde Elementary School walking to the farm. And they're walking in the street. Well, safety is a core mission of Verde K-8 school and sad to say before the revitalization of that corridor it, it was not a safe pathway for many of our students. Uh, we have students who walk 10, 15 city blocks to get here. Some take their bicycles, some take their scooters. Often they're in an entourage with baby strollers and extended family and with morning traffic, with business traffic flowing through this region as well, it was always uh, a bit uh, scary. We commend ourselves on having a uh, community plan uh, for the all of North Richmond. And this is one of the projects that were involved in that, where we look at what are we going to do comprehensively to make the area better? And that takes in, in account all the physical aspects, the um, social aspects, housing, um, everything involved in that, that plan that we put together to work, work toward a comprehensive uh, community um, improvement venture. The Design Construction Division started working on this project in 2018 and worked with various stakeholders including our grant funders, Caltrans, and our environmental groups in order to make sure that all the design features were incorporated into the construction uh, aspects of the project. The project spanned from Chesley Avenue to Brookside Drive through six, way, six roadway intersection and included the construction of 3,800 linear feet of concrete sidewalks. 11 pedestrian ramps and concrete ball bouts just like this, 700 linear feet of pedestrian trails, 38 street trees, and rehabilitated and reconstructed 3,800 linear feet, the equivalent of six blocks of pavement along Fred Jackson Way. Before we actually started construction, we made sure to reach out to all our residents to letting them know about the construction of the Fred Jackson Way project. We, look, we work with our property owners, our utility owners, and everybody who's using the roadway in order to come up with how we're going to go ahead and transform those existing features into the future improvements that are desired. We have an after school program that's hosted about five blocks from here and all of our community comes out together to escort our students to that after school program after the day program. Uh, it's a walking school bus uh, and it really makes it feel safe and, and fun for our community. Public Works has been great about reaching out to community stakeholders and getting input on the process. So I was definitely part of that process up front, talking about what the vision should be for our community. I really appreciated that we were able to host events at the school, bring community together to inform the process. Well, Public Works has, um, they've been great. I mean, they've come to um, our, our meetings and they basically articulated what they were trying to do, got feedback from us both at our meeting and separately and individually to, to make sure they're doing what the community wants. And they told us the process when, we, when they were applying for funds and how long it might take and, and they mapped out a schedule um, and took in concerns to, of the community as well. So they've been very transparent on what's going on and it was, and it was greatly received. 
and because it was, you know, it's been a long time. So uh, we, we're glad that it's happening now. I think one of the biggest things is my opportunity to transform ideas into something that somebody can use in the community. Seeing somebody drive on our roadways, walk on our sidewalks, or ride in our new bike lanes, there's a sense of fulfillment because we're translating what just is an idea or a sketch into something in real life. By widening the sidewalk and narrowing the travel lanes and soon to the bike lanes that will be here, that will show that all users of the road have a safe space to travel, bicyclists, pedestrians, as well as motorists. So it's kind of a shift towards our complete treats policy that we have here at Contra Costa County that we adopted in 2009. So the intent of the travel lanes to kind of move a little to the side is to help slow down cars in that process. I'm standing on a concrete ball belt, one of the ball belts constructed with the Fred Jackson Way project. The ball belts provide a wider area for our pedestrians to wait and while they're waiting to cross the street. Connectivity is, is better and I like the way the traffic has been slowed down based on the bumps outs and things of that nature. Yeah, Urban Tilth is an urban agriculture organization dedicated to getting healthy food uh, to Richmond and West County residents. Um, we grow food. We grow food at a local farm in seven different school and community gardens. And I think the most important thing is that we hire and train local residents to grow that food and distribute it and get it to the people in our own community uh, who need it. I feel like the, the redoing of the street is gives people a little bit of pride, like when someone else, when the, when the county cares about the streets and cares about the way it looks and how you can access it, you could see people taking you know some time with their own houses, doing paint jobs, fixing fences. It just brings everybody up, you know, like that, that investment um, makes people want to invest in their own houses and their own properties as well. We're just grateful for the community. Um, for the support that you've given us and the provision of safe travel to our school. Uh, our kids deserve it, they deserve everything, and we thank you for playing a, a large part in that. To learn more about our current and upcoming projects, visit us at cccpublicworks.org. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Inside Public Works. Here's a message from Contra Costa County Public Works Director, Brian Balbus. Well, thank you for joining us today and watching Inside Public Works. We hope that you enjoyed watching what Public Works does every day for the people of Contra Costa County. We have the unique and great responsibility of maintaining all of the public infrastructure that you use every single day. So I hope you got something out of the show, and I hope you will tune in in the future to enjoy future episodes of Inside Public Works. Hi, I'm Jocelyn LaRocque, Division Manager of Engineering Services. And join us next time on Inside, Inside Public, Public Works. Works. Contra Costa County Public Works has opportunities for many career paths, including engineers, maintenance workers, mechanics, building trades, administration, finance, and information technology. To learn more about career opportunities with Contra Costa County Public Works Department, visit contracosta.ca.gov forward slash CCC Public Works Careers. us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at CCC Public Works.